Yeah. You know, YouTube automatically records a whole live service anyway. But um, I still use the free conference call for the videos that I do. I encourage you to go on out and, and check that out. You know, if you haven't subscribed and been part of, go, go to Montgomery Faith Fellowship's uh, YouTube channel. I tell people at my other job, I'm, I'm a YouTuber. <laughs> Some of them said, so a few people have looked it up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's open up a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your spirit, and we thank you that you are the rescue, Jesus. You are the rescuer, and you rescue us. And we just thank you that Lord, we, we don't have to be afraid of anything. It's just not natural for us to be afraid. And we thank you for it, Lord, uh, for this new heart, this new life, and this trust in Jesus, in Jesus' name. Thank you that I speak as an oracle of God because we have ears to hear what your spirit is saying. And that, Lord, that what you want done, Holy Spirit, you are the teacher. We just yield ourselves to you, the teacher, the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. When we left off, we're going to be talking about part two of the rescue. Part one is up on the YouTube channel if you want to check it out that. Uh, but we left off last Sunday with the rescue of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Amen. By the way, uh, we got tickets to Daniel is $99. I think that's what it is. Yeah, they've gone up in price. But Daniel is my absolute favorite sight and sound uh, production there in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So uh, I want you to know that we're going to be doing that and make plans and preparations to do. Uh, kids are $42. Anyone involved? Three to 12 costs $42. Anyway. Uh, more of that will be will be collecting that, but um, and Daniel, and of course remember they got rescued from a persecution of the state uh, that used the fiery furnace, which they ended up heating up seven times more than normal, and uh, even the people who threw in, as we were talking reading last last week, even the people who threw them in, those elite guards and licked by the flame, died. However, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not. And there was a fourth man in there. Hallelujah. And um, in Daniel chapter 3, verse 28, King, King Nebuchadnezzar said, after recognizing and seeing that they weren't burned or consumed by the fire, he said, praise the, their God for sending an angel to rescue his servants. They trusted their God and refused to obey my commands. Yes, they chose to die rather than to worship or serve any uh, any God except their own. Hallelujah. Are you that? Are you, is that where you are today? Are, are you in that position, or do, is that the way you think? I tell you, if you want to see God operate in your life in a mighty, powerful way, Hallelujah. If you want to enjoy the the Lord's rescuing, because He will rescue you. I think we may not be thrown in any kind of fiery furnace, okay? I don't really see that happening. But on the same token, circumstances, situations in life rise up where you feel like you're going underwater and you need a rescue, right? When you when you feel like you're surrounded by the fire, I mean, on all sides, you are getting lapped up by, you feel like you're getting lapped up by the fire and it's getting you and it's slapping you and burning you and all kinds of things and you need a rescue, guess what? God is there. But you want to have that commitment that there is no other God but he. Amen. And that you're not going to yield or bend to any other will except his. Don't even bend to your own will. Make your will bend to his will. Amen. Now you're in charge of your will, so it's what you will is what you will. <laughs> And God made you that because you're in his image and likeness. Now, the Bible is full of stories where God rescues people because, you know, their faith in him. In fact, Hebrews 11 is all about how people's faith 
rescued them, did things because they trusted God rather than the circumstance, you know, letting the circumstance dictate, letting the situation dictate, letting persecution dictate, letting uh, let what other people say and what other, what other people think dictate. They didn't do that. They trusted the Lord, his word. And we're going to move on to the New Testament here where we'll look at Jesus when he walked on water. Interestingly, we read Matthew 14 this morning at our breakfast table. So it's kind of funny <laughs> paralleling there. But remember, this is when Peter walking on water with, and Jesus saved him out of the water, right? Matthew 14, and we'll be in the 22nd verse. Now, we're going to be flipping through the Bible. Get your Bible, your your page flipping fingers working. Got to lick them, lick them. Shake your hand anyway. It doesn't bother me. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. In the 22nd verse, and we'll read, um, <clears throat> I'll probably read the whole thing, and then we'll break it down. All right. Immediately, Jesus uh, made his disciples get into the boat and go up before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray, now when evening came, he was alone there, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them. We didn't even go right away, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> they saw him tossed in the sea, and he didn't go right away, just so you know. Walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. I mean, Peter, I mean, really putting it out there. So he said, Come. And when Peter uh, had came down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when the when he saw that the wind was boisterous, and he was afraid. Beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt and when? And when they got on, got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. All right, so let's just look at this, verses 22 to 24. This is where they, Jesus goes and it sends everybody away, sends the boat out. And let me just tell you, Jesus sent them out into the boat into the sea. Okay? Sometimes when the Lord calls you to do something, uh, he's well aware of the potential dangers that are involved, and he's still calling and sending you anyway. Just as Jesus did here. Okay? You know, bad things happening in your life isn't always a sign that Somehow you failed or you missed it. The apostles did exactly what Jesus told them to do. They got into the boat. They started going to the other side. And in the middle of the sea, the storm rose. And then Jesus saw it too, by the way. And he didn't come right away. He just let them flop around and have water for a little bit. I was like, what? That sounds so mean. I don't know. I mean, God has his timing sometimes that you have to get used to adjusting and, and, and being uh, willing to uh, compensate your life to 
wait for the Lord. Amen? See, waiting on the Lord doesn't always mean you have instant results that you can see with your eyes or feel. Waiting on the Lord means you get into the Word. Now, in their case, they got all worried. We can tell, we can tell from the content of the story that they were all afraid because of this wind. Now, I mean, these are fishermen, so they weren't unexperienced. They weren't. It was not like they were unfamiliar with the way the Sea of Galilee or Lake Tennesseret. Uh, they know the weather. They're not unfamiliar with any of it. In fact, they're not unfamiliar with getting into the sea because the Sea of Galilee was central to Jesus' ministry, wasn't it? I mean, he called the 12, many of the 12 disciples right off the sea. <laughs> I mean, so, you know, central to the work that Jesus was doing because he went from here to there on boats, preached out in the water, right? So it was central to his ministry. So it wasn't an unusual thing. You know, sometimes in, in we're doing our usual stuff, and then things pop up. Now, if you're like me, you hate that. I want my pattern, right? I want it to be done. <laughs> you get up, you go to work, you do this, right? You, you know, I don't want no car accidents. I don't want no anybody, you know, somebody having an emergency, <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? We, we don't want that. We want life to just be peachy in the usual. But you know, we're in a fallen world, it's not going to happen. But it doesn't mean you're out of the will of God. So don't don't be fooled by circumstances. Don't be fooled by your circumstances. Circumstances, they just are. They just are. But you go about doing the will of the Lord. You stick to the word of God. You walk with Jesus. You believe God. You know that God will never leave you nor forsake you. You keep that. You keep his word in the midst of your heart. You study him and know him and trust him always. And too many times people do let what they feel, what they see, what they touch, what's going on around them to dictate their moods, their attitudes. And look, I get it. I'm human too. I get it. But this is something we're going to have to mature in. We have to mature in this. <clears throat> now, in verse 25, it says that uh, now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. Now, in Mark's account of this, Mark 6, 48, adds, and would have passed them by. Think about that. Not only was it he waited, he had to get his prayer in first. That's a good thing Jesus had to get his prayer on because he might not have been ready to walk on the water. You see, one of the things we can learn from Jesus is we got to take time to fellowship with Father. we got to take time to pray. And sometimes we got to put other things off in order to do that. And uh, that really should be a habit that you have in life, is that prayer, that time with the Lord. And uh, studying the Word, reading the Word, learning the Word, just fellowshipping with God, as Jesus did. You want to see God operate in your life? Spend time with Him. He'll call you to all kinds of things. He'll, he'll lead you to do some unusual things in life and your uh, he'll mess up your usual schedule occasionally uh, or if, if he ain't doing it the devil will try to mess up your usual schedule okay you understand there that we got we got conflicting wars going on in this world and i don't just mean the natural ones i mean there's spiritual wars there are battles that we are engaged in. You don't think the enemy, the devil's going to let you fly by, you know, fly just real sweet and easy, you know, through life, uh, just you and Jesus walking, and it's all going to be peachy and sweet and lovely. No, 
If you're going to walk with Jesus, trouble is all around. But trouble does not move you or scare you. And I think, you know, I'm just wondering if Jesus was having so much fun walking on the water as to why he was going to walk on by him. I mean, that's pretty cool, wouldn't you think? I think he was going to walk on by him because he was having fun walking on that water. That's pretty cool. Totally, totally supernatural, right? You don't, you know, it's not like he knows where the little secret rocks are in the lake. Because rocks aren't usually that high, even in that lake. I mean, it's got to be really low water for him to walk on rocks. So, yeah, the angels were upholding him, keeping him up. As he was walking, his word gave them the authority to do it. Now, in verse 26, though, remember what happened here. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled. I mean, if, if the storm wasn't bad enough, now they're seeing ghosts. I bet you they thought they were going to die. Because now they're seeing ghosts walking on the water, walking on the sea, right? And they cried out for fear. You know, I bet you they were thinking they were going to die. I mean, you don't go around seeing ghosts. I mean, your first conclusion is that a ghost walking on that water. I mean, yeah, it's not normal. It's true. <laughs> but, you know, it wasn't too long ago Jesus said, let's go to the other side, and a storm rose up on, in, in the middle of that sea as well. But the last time Jesus was asleep during the middle of that storm, you ever felt like God's asleep in the middle of your storm? I mean, the Bible's just, I mean, there's so many parallels I draw out of the Word. Just the, I mean, you may be, you're going through a fire, and it's not that God isn't with you, but he's asleep. Not because he's asleep sleep. What it means is he's waiting. And besides that, what was the lesson we learned from that? Jesus said to them, you're going to the other side, didn't he? So that ship wasn't going to sink. I don't care how much water got on it. It wasn't sinking. It wasn't sinking. I mean, they were going across that lake. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, Paralleling that, okay, Jesus again told them to go to the other side, and he's going to catch up with them. Of course, they didn't bother asking how in the world you're going to catch up with me, but I guess they figured some fishermen will take them across, right? They had no idea he was walking. Okay, now for you who are always looking for the supernatural, I believe in the supernatural. I believe laying hands on the sick and they shall recover. I believe talking in tongues. I believe... I believe signs, gifts, and wonders. I know God does mighty things. I know he does. I've seen him work things out in ways that only God could have done. You know, and what was I fretting over? You see, I, I, you know, God is big enough if we will see him as such. But now here we have another situation where there's a storm, and something supernatural was going on, and they still ended up being fearful, didn't they? I mean, another storm, and God does something even more supernatural than the other time. The other time, he said, you go across the street, go across the lake, you know, we'll get it. And remember what happened there. I mean, when, he, when they got to the other side, there was a legion there and had to be cast out, the pigs, right? And so... You know, that storm was probably not a natural storm. That was probably stirred up by legion, okay? But this storm is probably very natural because that is the temperament of the lake at times. And and um, so, and, and then here's something supernatural happens, and they still go to the negative. 
It must, we're all going to die. I'm seeing ghosts. So what you got to identify and what the Holy Spirit is trying to help you identify is, you know, we're people, you're people, and even if God was to do something supernatural before you, you might still not believe. You still might not believe because something supernatural happened and they did not believe. They thought it was a ghost, that they were going to die. They were afraid. They got afraid when God moved supernaturally. That's why I laugh when people say, oh, well, you know, if God just, so, you know, I've heard people, even today people say that. Oh, you know, God's got to show you something, do something big, you know. Oh, yeah. And, and, and if he was to do that, you'd probably be afraid even then. Understand humanity. You believe God's word, period. Let that be the end of the story right there. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. I'm not against signs and wonders. I expect signs and wonders. I do. But it's God's word that gives me faith. It's God's word in which this world, this universe was formed, and I'm creating the image and likeness of, of God, so my words form and create. And because I'm like God, I've got to be careful what I say, because if not, I might be saying, uh, playing into the devil's plan of destruction with my words being fearful. Oh, what am I going to do? Oh, oh, i, I got to watch out. I don't want to get my cold. I don't want to get a cold. <laughs> you can't be afraid and you can't let your words slip out your mouth like that. If it's coming out of your mouth, it better be the word of God. It better be faith-filled words. It better be words that, that are just like what Jesus would say. And what did Jesus say? We're going to the other side. He said it again. Go to the other side. He said it again. So let's go, let's stick to the Bible, let's stick to the Word and confess it. Let it be on your lips, let it be in your heart. But that's the thing. If it's not, if whatever is in your heart is coming out of your mouth. So what you truly believe, you're speaking. So if you take that, maybe record yourself. You know, your phone's now, you can record yourself. Record yourself. Listen to yourself. You know, one of the things when I started editing my videos and I was hearing myself, oh, man, I do not like the way my voice sounds. <laughs> I'm surprised you all stayed to listen. But that has helped me tremendously because I'm listening to myself, what I'm saying, how I'm saying it, the way I'm saying it. And, 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 being able to do that, wow, doesn't that make an impression on, 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 on how I should walk or talk or be, right? I mean, Miss Evelyn always sends me these voice texts. Pastor John, good morning. <laughs> I have a question. I don't feel bad. Yeah, you sound just like you sound. You, the, the way you sound is the way I'm hearing it. Don't worry. You understand your own voice. When you hear your own voice, it's deeper in your own head than it is everywhere else. I I got a sort of a higher pitched voice than I realized. I mean, it's, anyway. But let's just recognize our humanity here. I mean, even if God was to do something supernatural, are you going to be afraid? I mean, look, look, they're in a tough situation, no doubt. I mean, we're talk I mean, look, even as experienced fishermen, they know that the sea has taken ships down. They know it. So they know. So they know. As fishermen, they fought against the waves and the storms and the sea before. It's not unusual. They, they it's just part of life on the lake, but. And then working, uh, catching fish, they were fish, like some of them were fishermen, they were catching fish, you know, working that way. Uh, so they weren't, and life will do that. I mean, things happen in life. It's, it's like, you know, one day you, 
you, you, you go in and, you know, it's really easy work, and then the next day it's like all of a sudden it's just you're piled up. You know, and things happen, just things come at you in a flash, and then in a quick moment it seems like, like all of a sudden it's one way, and then all, the next day it's everything blown up in, well, you wonder. Okay? But remember here in verse 27, it says here, but immediately, everybody say immediately. Okay, this is, this is what the Holy Spirit says immediately, quickly. It says, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. You see, that was Jesus' response to that situation. You know, they were in a dire situation by all natural circumstances as far as it goes. I mean, they, they were in the middle of the storm. They were taking on water. The waves were very boisterous. The wind was very boisterous. They knew, they knew what that could mean. They knew that they could be taken on water. They knew that they could sink. And yet, here this figure is walking across the water. They think it's a ghost, so they think they're going to die. So now they got that on top of the, the, just the storm. And immediately, Jesus says, it is I. Do not be afraid. And I know the Holy Spirit is saying that to us even today. I mean, when, when, when a situation rises up and it's bad, it's not good, it's, it's rough, it's like, how am I even going to pay this bill? How am I going to even... Uh, make this great? How am I going to uh, uh, deal with this person? Okay? And, and, and I mean, they're, they're coming at you. Things are coming at you. Things are coming at you. And you're thinking, this is not right. This is not what's supposed to happen. And you would be correct. God is not wanting people to hurt one another. God is not wanting people to be mean and cruel. God is not wanting these circumstances, these, these circumstances of bad happen. When you think about the Garden of Eden, there, there, he did, he did, they weren't having that. The original uh, state of the Garden of Eden was beautiful. It was working. It, there was nothing to be afraid of. And when the, uh, you know, God doesn't want these Un horrible things that happen in people's lives, yet they do because we're in a fallen world. And so immediately your knee-jerk response is, this should not be. It's correct. That is a correct understanding. But when you're basing your life on the Word and you know that you sh it's not supposed to be, then that's when you have got to put what is supposed to be in operation. And that's the Word of God. That has to immediately come in. Immediately the Holy Spirit is speaking within you. Yeah, this sickness, is, you should not be sick. You shouldn't be. You should not be sick. You should not have this ache and pain. You should not have this disease. You should not. But that's when we take up the Word of God as our banner and start declaring that it will not. Start declaring that what God's Word says, for example, by Jesus' stripes, I am healed. And if I, or actually because it says that, uh, that by His stripes we were healed, so if we were healed, that means I am healed. Okay? It's past tense. So you're, you're to be healed. Today, right now, you're supposed to be healed in every part of your body and, and your soul as well. Your soul. Your, your soul needs to be healed. Now, your spirit gets born again. You just get born again. You don't, you don't need to be healed there in the spirit. You get born again. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. But your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, they need to be healed. Yes, absolutely. Your body needs to be healed. Yes, absolutely. And that's what it's supposed to be. And so believe that. That's because the Holy Spirit is immediately saying, yes, I sent my word, believe it. I sent my word, be healed. 
You're healed. That is the knee-jerk reaction, because it's not supposed to be there. The devil doesn't have a right to trespass on God's temple. He doesn't have a right. But, you know, like, like a thief, he'll try to do it. Sneak in on property he ain't supposed to be on. Try to take from you your health. He ain't supposed to have that. So stand on the word. Follow that knee-jerk reaction. No, it's not supposed to happen, and I'm not letting it happen. In Jesus' name, bless God, I'm healed. No, devil, I'm not. No, I return to sender. I will not take that. You're not going to send that sickness. You're not going to send that strife in my family. No, no, I, nope, not taking it. Immediately. And I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to us today. So when you get into a situation that needs a uh, rescue, guess what? Immediately you're supposed to do exactly what you're supposed to do, and that is trust the word. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, king, you know, whether, you know, we get delivered or not, doesn't matter. Uh, the word, you know, God is still true, and if we die, we die. But, you know, we're not, we're not going to worship or bow down to this God that you've put up before us. not happening. And see, I, you know, I get these things out of Scripture. Uh, for example, uh, John 14, 27. John 14, 27. Peace. I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you, give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I, scriptures like that. An another one. Let's, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy 1, 7. Okay? These are scriptures that I use. in conjunction with the knee-jerk reaction that it should not be. Verse 7. For God has not given us a, a, a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I'm not losing it. I have the mind of Christ. It's a sound mind. I can do this. I can make this happen. This can work. I am healed. I have a sound mind. And see, scriptures like this tells me that God didn't give me a spirit of fear. So if there's fear going on in my life, it didn't come from God. Your born-again spirit doesn't have fear. It's power, meaning authority. Love, the love of God shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. Love covers the multitude of sin. Love is who God is. And a sound mind, the mind of Christ. Believe me, the mind of Christ always knows what to do. You have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. That's the mind of Christ, following the unction. Know the scripture? That's just a couple of them, all right? Now, let's, we have to have the same response as Jesus said, and that is, you, for example, you might have read, heard the story about Smith Wigglesworth, okay, and how he was lying in his bed sleeping, and he, some noise or something woke him up. He turned, I woke up, turned over, and saw... What he said was Lucifer. He said it was Satan. Well, it be, whether it's either Satan or a demon, it doesn't matter. He saw it. And he said, oh, it's just you. Turned back over, rolled back over, and went back to sleep. I think God wants us have the same attitude. Oh, it's just you, devil. Oh, it's just you. I'm in the boat with Jesus. So if Jesus is sleeping at the helm, so am I. <laughs> he said, we're going to the other side. <laughs> Amen. 
See, I believe God wants us to have that same mind. That knee-jerk reaction should be your motivation for saying, no, no, you don't, devil. You will not trespass. You will not get away with this. No, you won't, little slew foot. Not doing it. God's word is established and yours is not. <laughs> Hallelujah. Have that same attitude. Oh, it's just you, devil. Okay. Go back to sleep. <laughs> I mean, just think about it. Jesus was willing to sleep in the middle of the storm. Why don't you? Put you put you to bed and just enjoy time with the Lord. Amen? Spend that time in prayer. Spend that time in the Word. Building yourself up in your most holy faith. Praying in tongues. Come on now. Hallelujah. Back to Matthew 14. And, and here... This is where it gets even more interesting. So he said, and Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So here we have Jesus walking on water. And now look at this. So he said, come. I mean, Jesus wasn't afraid, with, afraid of that request either, was he? Oh, I'm walking on water in the middle of the storm. You come walk on water in the middle of the storm. Come on, Peter. I bet he got a little glimmer of excitement. Oh, look at this. I ain't the only one walking on water. My disciple Peter is going too. And he's, all the other disciples are going to see it too. And then he had the nerve to get out of the boat and put his foot down on the water. Come on now. I mean, really. That, I mean, that knee-jerk reaction to the word of God I mean, he didn't, he didn't even think about it, really. He just got out of the boat and started walking on the word of the Lord, who said, come. It wasn't until he started looking at the wind and the waves that he started to get fearful and sink. You see, get out on the word. Amen. Get out on that word and walk. You know, that excites the Lord. You ever notice how you can jump and get all excited because something good's happening and the good word is happening? Come on now. Get excited. Get out on the water. Walk. And, and see, you know, a lot of us will find ourselves in that knee-jerk reaction going to the Word, and then start making our stance. But then we, you know, we don't see something immediately change. It wasn't instant. And then all of a sudden we start to, if we're paying attention to the circumstance, begin to start allow our thoughts to go to being fearful. Just like Peter he started looking around, and stand, instead of just walking on that word, he started looking around. And the circumstance, because it hadn't quit, Jesus and Peter were both walking on water in the middle of the storm. You can see why Jesus' response to Peter was what it was. When he started sinking. In verse 31, well, let's, let's go ahead and let's read uh, 29. And it says, and he said, come. And Peter had come down out of the boat. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. See, look, that, what was his eye on at first? Jesus. He responded to the word of God, and he kept his eye on the author and finisher of his faith. He kept his eye on it, on him. And then he started walking on the water. So then look what happens. But, never say anybody say but. You don't want to be a but to your, your faith. You, you know what? Doubt is a but to your faith, man. It is trying to mess up your faith. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, 
mean, come on now. Wasn't it blowing when he when Jesus said come? Wasn't it blowing when he was looking at Jesus and, and Jesus and asking the question? Wasn't it, wasn't the wind blowing still at that time too? It absolutely was. What's the difference? He kept his eye on Jesus. He acted on the word. But when he started looking at the circumstances, all of a sudden he gets down, starts walking, eye on Jesus, and oh, that wave almost slapped me in the head. What did he do? He got his eyes off of Jesus. He for, obviously, he quickly forgot the word that he just got heard. How many times have you done that? You start out, oh, yeah, okay, all right, your word says, boom, and then you forget about it an hour later. It's that long. We don't want to, we want to be doers of the word, right? We don't want to look and behold our, our natural face in a mirror, right? And forget what manner of man we are. A woman, for that matter. It's a general term. Some women are just men. It's a little different. They're still men. <laughs> I had a request of further explanation. <laughs> All right, but <laughs> but see, look, that we don't want to be forget who we are. I mean, look, you guys started your knee jerk reaction. Boom! I got in my. What stopped you from believing and continuing that? You were looking back at the circumstances. It didn't. Some immediate change didn't happen. It didn't immediately change. It was still going on when he stepped out, and it was still going on when he was walking. And and and, but because he get, got his eyes off of Jesus, then he began to be afraid. He started sinking. But here we go again. All right. He said, but when he saw the wind and the boisterous, it was boisterous, and he was was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, "Lord, save me!" Oh, save me. Oh, you ever got in that prayer? Oh, God, deliver me. Oh, oh. I guess you're not, I'm not the only one that's done that. Oh, God, save me. And immediately, look what it says in verse 31. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him. You know, it's not wrong to call on the Lord, and when you do, he's the rescue. Amen. He will be there to the rescue. He is your rescuer. He immediately, everybody say immediately. So immediately when you call on the Lord, he is working towards it, but he's going to expect a little something from you who've been walking with him a little longer, who've seen some things happen in your life. You know, God expects you to grow. Okay? And if, if you've had a miracle happen in your life, if you've walked on the Word of God and it worked, now God is going to expect you a little bit more from you than he did before. Because you need to take that knowledge. Don't forget it. Look, if, 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 if the Word worked before, it'll work now. Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Word doesn't change. He's the Word made flesh. He doesn't change. You, when you're in that situation, you cannot forget. And realize that you're now accountable to growth. When God works and does something, He expects something out of you. And he expects you to be, be, be believing and not doubting, not given to fear. Since he didn't give you a spirit of fear, why are you fearful? Why are you afraid? What's up with you that you don't realize that you're not supposed to be afraid? 
And when you are afraid, you know you're not supposed to be afraid. You know you shouldn't have that fear. You know you shouldn't be afraid. I shouldn't have to be afraid to walk out my front door. You're right. So don't. Don't be afraid. Trust the Lord. Follow His Spirit. Now, if He tells you don't walk out the door, well, then you might want to hold tight until He tells you you can go. But that's all because of a relationship and prayer and time and, and fellowship and knowing and discerning the witness of the Holy Spirit on the inside, growing. But God expects you to grow. Everybody say, God wants me to grow. God expects me to grow. I am growing now. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. <clears throat> now, immediately he stretched out his hands, and what did he say to him? Oh, you of little faith. Now, I'm not going to get into it today, but we know what little faith means. It doesn't mean small size. It means length of faith. Oh, you of little faith. I mean, he didn't even say to him, oh, Peter, oh, I'm sorry, let me dry you off. Oh, I'm so sorry that this happened. And, but that's what some of y'all want from God. <laughs> oh, here, let me just pat you down. You don't want that. But no, Jesus goes right to it. Oh, you of little faith. Where did you start doubting? Why? Why? You know, God expects you to be an adult, folks. He expects you to grow up. Put on big boy pants. You got to put on, you know, we say that when we, you know, oh, now it's time to really work. Put on your big shoes. Put on your, your grown-up pants now. And kids, I, you know, naturally, you think about your own self. <clears throat> kids naturally want to grow up. They want to be like mommy and daddy. They want to be an adult. They want to have their own. So if they're, if they're wanting that anyway, why are you trying to keep your kid a child still? See, this is the problem with some of the, the teaching in schools and stuff. They're trying to keep kids children. I'm not saying get married off at 13, all right? I'm not talking about that kind of nonsense. But I'm telling you, kids want to grow up. I wanted to grow up. I wanted the freedom to do. And that's not wrong. That's completely natural. So work with it, parents. Work with it. You want to grow up? Okay, let's help you. Quit being a kid. Grow up. Time to get off the milk and start eating some meat. And God's saying the same thing to you. Grow up. Quit teetering around in the faith message and not walking it. Get into the Word. Get it in your heart. Get it on your lips. Let it be in your mind. Let it renew it. Let the Spirit of God rise up big because I'm bigger than this universe. I encompass the universe. You see, this is where we gotta we got to work with the Lord on these things. <clears throat> and like I said, Hebrews uh, 13, verses 8 through 9, and, and uh, I'm only going to read the nine part, uh, like the second part of 9, not the whole verse. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace. You are saved by grace through faith. Yes, you're saved by grace, but it's your faith that gets that grace working in your life, doesn't it? You had to have faith in Jesus to ask him into your heart to save you, didn't you? You heard that he was gracious and that he'll be merciful, so you had to believe that, and you said, okay, Lord, I call on Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. Isn't that what you did to get saved? Pretty much, isn't it? Jesus... Take my life and do something with it. You got to that place. 
You're saved by grace through faith, and you got it. You're here today. The fact that you're here today is the fact that the testimony that that, has, that some of that reality has gotten into you. Well, look, you got to walk by faith, not by sight. you got to walk by the grace of God, and it requires faith, but God expects you to grow. So the grace is still the same, it's, but he expects you to maintain your confession about who Jesus is, the same yesterday, today, and forever. It, he doesn't change just because you forgot. He's still the same. So we got to get that word on the inside and then build another scripture. Let's go to Matthew 7. Immediately, God will rescue you. He is the rescuer. And the 24th verse, Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended. Didn't say it wasn't going to rain, did it? In fact, he said it was going to descend. What well, didn't he? It was going to descend. The rain descended. The floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. See, it's the sayings of the Lord. It's his word. Build your house on it. Uh, let's go to John 8. These scriptures show me how uh, that God will immediately save you and will continue to save you, but he does expect you to grow. So he is there to save you in John chapter 8, 58. Now this upset the people around them when they said it, but it's true just the same. Verse 58, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, say to you before Abraham was, I am. He, he, pulled a, he pulled out a big name there. In your, in your most Bibles, that I am is capital, capital I, capital A, capital M, because it's the name of God. This is the name that God said to Moses at the bush that was burning, but not burning up. He said, I am. So fill in, what is he? I am. Fill in the blank. I am your Savior. I am your healer. I am the one who provides. I am the one that gives you wisdom. I am the one that has the plan from beginning to end for your life. I am the one who will deliver you and your children and your uncle and your aunt and your mother. I am the one who will never leave you nor forsake you so you're never alone. I am the one who is the originator of all knowledge and understanding. Now, I didn't create the knowledge and understanding of wrong. That was all the devil. You, you know, lying and all that, that came from the devil. That, that originated with him. It didn't even originate with God. That was all Satan. A liar, a thief, a rebel rouser. That was all Satan. That's all original with him. But God is, I'm still the healer. I'm still the deliverer. I don't care if the rebel comes up and does what he does. I am still your deliverer. You see, I am the rescuer. Fill in the blank. Who is God to you? See, you got to, you know, Jesus asked him, okay, what does everyone say I am? Okay, what do you say I am? Well, you are the Christ. Okay. That was revealed to you by the Spirit. See, it's what you say. He is. He is. Let's go to another verse. Galatians chapter 1. God is still the, Jesus is still the rescuer. He's still the deliverer today. That hasn't changed. And in Galatians 1. Verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, 
to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. He said he will deliver you from this present age. Is your circumstance in this present age? Huh? Well, Jesus said, I'm a deliverer. Hallelujah. I'm still the one. I'm still your Savior. I'm still the one. Amen. Keep your faith, keep your faith turned on. Keep the word building up in you. If you feel like complaining, start filling up with the word. And start proclaiming. Proclaiming what the Bible says. Proclaiming what Jesus did. Amen. That's how the rescuer can work in your life. He is the rescuer, but you gotta be okay, Lord. Like Sarah be second you gotta say to him, Lord, we don't care if uh he doesn't deliver us, we're still not bound. We gotta be that we gotta be that 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 bold, that 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 strong. Keep that right in the front, you know. But they first said he is able and will deliver them. They knew it. But they were just adding a little extra there. It doesn't matter what you may see. We're going to be delivered from your hands. And that's the same thing. He said, Paul wrote right here, that it's through his grace and peace. Peace. Everybody say peace. You have peace? Are you growing in that peace? It is the fruit of the Spirit, and fruit grows. So if you're not experiencing peace right now, you got to grow some more. But it's there. It's for your taking. You can have the peace. It's in you. It's part of your makeup. It's part of your spirit. You know, I'm thinking about church history. Remember John, who wrote, John, the Gospel, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Book of Revelations. That John? Remember? What happened to him? Okay? This is church history. Why don't you put up the old pattern? See that little island there? Kind of right off in the middle there? Off to the like center left little? That's patents. That's how it looks. To this day, that's what it looks like. Remember what happened there? Earliest extent, extent reference to John being thrown in a bullying oil from uh, Tertullian. I would say it right. Tertullian, 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 in uh, 200. His casual mention of the event suggests that it was a widely known story during his day, although it is hard to say by what amount of time the story predated Tertullian. And this is what it reads in uh, newadvent.org, uh, Fathers, this is the story I lifted out for the internet. Um, Church history, there's, a, there's a, a church history. It's called Christianity Stack Exchange. That's where I'm getting this information from. But this is a quote from uh, the writings of Tertullian. Uh, Since, moreover, you are close upon Italy, you have Rome, from which there comes even into our own hands the very authority of the apostles themselves. How happy is it, church? on which apostles poured forth all their doctrine along with their blood, where Peter endures a passion like his Lord's, where Paul wins his crown in a death like John the Baptist, where the apostle John was first plunged unhurt into boiling oil and thence remitted to his island exile. This was the all Patmos where he got the book of Revelation. He got the, the letters to the churches and the Revelation, which is what we know today as the book of Revelation. All those letters and stuff were all put together in that one book. So if the story has any basis, in fact, it is usually assumed that assumed to have taken place late in the reign of Dominican, uh, Domitian, I should say, 81, 81 to 696. 
um, uh, common error. And the only book of the New Testament that directly covers church history, the Acts of the Apostles, ends in about 61. Assuming Johannian uh, authorship of 1 John, 3 John, 2 John, 3 John, Gospel John, and Revelation would not be expected to mention it either. Thus, we would not expect the story to be mentioned in the Bible, even if it is true. So that's why it's probably not in there. Um, so even, even now, even after Jesus is long gone, and John was carrying and carrying the message, and he was the last apostle to die. The last one. He saw the Lord's return, just as Jesus said he would. Okay, uh, you know, he, God hasn't changed, and He's still out there saving you, and He's already saved. Just like this all Patmos, He got delivered from there. They couldn't boil him. And they couldn't keep them in the Isle of Patmos anymore. They let them go. You know, that's the way God will work at times. But we have to be believing him, not have little faith. we got to have the faith that endures, the faith that when God says it, I believe it, that settles it. And you will have and see the rescue. You will see the rescue, but you got to hold on to the word. Amen? Hold on to the word. Keep it on your lips. Don't look in the mirror and forget that you're a child of God and your body is a temple. Don't forget that. Keep that in your, in your mind. Talk to your father. He'll help renew that every day. The Bible says you're renewed every day in the spirit. And it'll renew your flesh, too. It'll heal your flesh. Amen? He'll deliver you. He is the rescue. Amen. He will rescue you from whatever you're in. But you got to trust him and believe his word and follow his word. That means you gotta, you got to put your emotions aside and just believe God's word. And do it. Walk in love when, when it doesn't feel like walking in love. That's what you have to do. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, let's stand to worship God. Amen. Let me just pray. Father God, I just thank you in Jesus' name that you are still the rescuer. You rescue us. We have everything we need in Christ, Lord. I thank you that we have our eyes on God, and your word is pressed in our hearts and in our ears, even this morning. And we thank you, Lord, that we have now the Spirit of God working, the Word of God working in our lives, and we thank you, Father, as we worship you and exalt you, that your Word is coming to pass in our life. It's on. It's in our hearts. It's renewed our minds, and it's on our lips. And we thank you, Father, for your truth and your realities in our lives. And we just give you glory, praise, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Oh, I love her.